Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. I'm Muhammad Shahidi and I am delighted to welcome everyone to the National Competitiveness Webinar, a webinar series brought to you by Malaysia Productivity Corporation or better known as MPC. Today is actually the first series for the National Competitiveness Webinar for 2021. And today's topic is Behavioral Insight Framework Series 1. Behavioral Insight or BI is an increasingly used term within public institutions to refer to efforts made to gain accurate and evidence-based understanding of how people behave and make decisions. Planning, designing, and implementing policies and programs on the basis of this deeper understanding will increase their impact. Insights into people's behavior are obtained through the application of behavioral and social sciences, anthropology, cognitive sciences, and psychology, among others. When seeking behavioral evidence, this discipline work together to identify which factor and biases will increase the probability for that behavior occurs, occurs or not. When used to improve policies and programs, BI can inform the design of innovative processes and practices, help reframe and improve communication, identify the need for nudges to overcome biases and barriers, or ensure that product and services are designed keeping users' need in mind. And right now, our country uh, via MPC is embracing BI and pioneering the usage of BI and one of the experts for BI is our speaker today, Mr. Eddie Razak. Uh, let me briefly introduce Mr. Eddie Razak. Eh? Mr. Eddie Razak is a senior advisor at Eden Strategy Institute, Singapore. Uh, it is an institution providing advisory and professional consultancy services internationally for governments and corporations, focusing on policy and innovation. Mr. Eddie was formerly executive vice president at the National Innovation Agency under the Malaysian government. Uh, prior to that, uh, Mr. Eddie was the inaugural CEO to the Malaysian Investor Relations Association, which was set up for capital market development by the Stock Exchange and the Securities Commission of Malaysia. Uh, before that, he was Finance Director and Senior Group Advisor of JPK Holdings and GPS Resources, two public listed companies respectively where his role was in corporate finance, mergers and acquisition, and investor relations. Earlier, he was with two major multinationals, uh, Lucent Technologies in mobile telecommunication and in Shell in oil and gas in various roles in finance. Uh, Mr. Eddy started his career at MIMB Investment Bank. He does voluntary work in education and social services, among others. Mr. Eddie completed his master in public management as a Lee Kuan Yew Fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at National University of Singapore and John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He did his undergraduate at the University of Maryland where he obtained two Bachelors of Sciences degrees, one in finance and one in management science and statistics. Surely one of the best person for today's webinar. And I, I would also like to take this opportunity to remind our viewers today that you guys can ask questions, give opinion, which is just a chat box on Zoom. And I will uh, relay the questions uh, to Mr. Eddie. So I guess without further ado, I would like to you know, uh, invite our speaker, Mr. Eddie. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Eddie. Silakan. Uh, Mr. Eddie, you need to unmute first, Mr. Eddie. Yeah? Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Shadi, and uh, thank you to MPC for uh, inviting me to uh, do this webinar with them. This, as you know, is, uh, is the first of three sessions. Uh, the second and third are on uh, 26 January and uh, 9th of February. And uh, today what we'll do is we'll, we'll give a, a part of the picture and we'll continue in the other sessions because um, the topic can be uh, quite in depth. We'd like to go in depth on this. Now today we, we are looking at um, a framework for developing behavioral insights for policymakers. And this framework is called Prime Framework. I'll explain more. But in this session today, uh, we will be looking at the principles and theories. So may I go to the next slide? 
Okay, so today's session, we look at principles and theories. And then on the second session, we look at design strategies, and then we look at delivery processes. So uh, today, we just, on uh, principles and theories, we look at these, you see the bullet points here, human model, theory. we'll cover all this. And in the second session, we look at how we actually design behavioral interventions. And then in the third session, we look at how we actually implement on ground these, these, uh, these interventions. So um, let me begin. Now, on your right, you will see uh, prime, the prime framework. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. There's too much detail for now, but look at the left. This is an introduction. So what is behavioral insights? <clears throat> it's a field that is used not just in public service, but in many, many other, even in corporations. But what it does, it generates interventions that are actually low cost. And these low cost interventions result in better outcomes because it takes into account people's behaviors and people's reactions. So it is achieved through things like reinforcement, indirect suggestions and all that, taking into account the human model. And this is very important. So I mentioned the human model, right? Okay, now I, let's contextualize this in, uh, in terms of the pandemic that we're going on right now, that we're going through right now. Okay, you know, there's a vaccine coming, there's all the science and technology, but imagine the behavior is so important. It is so as important as science and economics here because behaviors like washing hands, wearing a mask, social distancing, it's very hard. You can have laws to create that, but what you need is participation and people's cooperation. That is behavior. That's the importance of behavior. That's a snapshot. But let's go deeper into um, the psychology of humans, right? Okay, let's, uh, let, me, let me put forward a question to you, right? So for instance, you put off something because of a hassle, you put it off, you don't do it. Or you listen to the opinion of friends who make decisions or just because other cars are slowing down, you also slow down. You know, traffic lights, when the light, when the light changes, but then you look right and left, you see what people are doing. When people move, then you move. Now, this is human behavior. Now, why is that? It's because people use a lot of mental shortcuts. And people have something that uh, researchers call bounded rationality, <clears throat> which is bounded by how our mental cognition is. And then we make decisions through satisfying. Have you heard the word satisfying? Satisfying is to satisfy and to suffice. So, macam cukup cukup, uh, that's how we make decisions. Right. And then humans also think by way of analogy. They compare and contrast by way of analogy. And, but then, is that all wrong? You know, is that bad about humans? Are humans weak and all that? Not really, because... People find that even machines cannot be as smart as humans until they have artificial intelligence and fuzzy logic. So like chess, for instance, they cannot beat the, the world chess champion unless they have AI and fuzzy logic because this is an advantage that humans have. So now let's look at that in the realm of uh, economics uh, versus this new field or behavioral insights, which some people say is a branch of economics. For traditional economics, in the past, people always assume that people, human beings are just rational. You give them something, you tell them all the facts, you tell them the price and all that, they will make the best decision because they want to maximize whatever benefit to them. They will make the best decision, taking into account the logic. So you offer a, a grant, you offer a project, let's say a government offers a grant, and then the grant is good, 3,000 ringgit. So everybody should accept it. But sometimes people don't accept. Why? You know, why is it people don't, even though something is good? So according to Behavioral Insights, and this is a study that uh, has, has come about through uh, a branch of economics where they look at pure economics and there are a lot of shortcomings in pure economics. So they look at why. So when they look at why, they find that there is a subset of economics where the human condition actually uh, does not fit in exactly with what economists would like to assume that humans do. So for instance, we are not always mathematically rational. 
But our irrational behaviors actually are very predictable and systematic. This is funny, you know. We are not rational, but we are predictably irrational. You can predict that we are irrational. And then people are influenced by things like their environment, their emotions, their social networks, and other things that influence their irris irrationality. So when I say irrational, right? What people, what humans do often is they rely on heuristics. Have you heard of the word heuristics? Heuristics means rule of thumb, mental shortcut, biases, things like that. So like aga aga, you know, right? So that's how humans think. But this is predictable. This is the interesting thing. The irrationality is predictable because we can research the root cause of those behaviors. Even though they're unhealthy, we can actually research the root cause. We can run experiments and then we can design interventions that sort of nudge them or change their behavior. And we can also create a database of evidence, not just in Malaysia, maybe evidence from outside can also be applied here. Maybe some are diff slightly different, but most of the evidence is similar. I mean, people who be people who behave here is similar to how they behave elsewhere. And you use this evidence of the behaviors and you can use it to design policies. Be part of making that policy. Right, so I mentioned heuristics. There's a, a, quite a bunch, there's a lot of heuristics, a lot of biases, but uh, uh, we'll go through some of this, but maybe if you read it, you'll find hmm, quite familiar actually. Huh? Let's look at the first one, loss aversion. This guy, he is very hesitant to sell his house. Although actually that's the best thing, he should sell it. So financially, that's a very good decision, but he's hesitant because sayang, all kinds of reason. A second one, framing. Eh? You see something, if sees, a fruit, sees fruits at, for sale in a wet market, doesn't buy it because it's in a wet market. And then go to a boutique store, eh? buys the fruit, even though it's more expensive. Why do people behave like that? Because it's framed in a way that influences you to buy that. Anchoring. You want to contribute to charity, you want to see what, what other people donate. So other people donate 30 ringgit, you also follow 30 ringgit. You anchor on other people's decisions. Um, and then let's say this availability, you want to travel and then you look at a Facebook post about increase uh, pickpocketing in a particular country. Sorry, I use the example of Cambodia. Should not be uh, uh, selective here, but any country really. And then you decide not to travel. That's because something just recent, although incidents like this happen everywhere, but you just look at one incident and you, you, you look at it because that information is just available to you. Okay, this one, next one is very common, which is sunk cost. You have already spent money on something and you also, Tanarugi, you sayang, sayang do it too. Uh, even though you've got more important things or better alternatives, you're willing to just use that thing because you already spent it, even though the thing is actually, sometimes let's say, you know, some people I know, they buy shampoo. The shampoo actually is no good, but they already spent so much money, eh? So it's always bad for their hair, but they still use it because sayang, you know, that one, eh? mm, That is sunk cost. Uh, status quo. So um, it's so complicated. This In this example, it's so complicated to change the Wi-Fi that in the end, mm, just stick to the same one. So people don't change. People don't improve because status quo bias. It's easy to stick to the status quo. Scarcity. Scarcity. Uh, you want to buy, uh, let's say this example, want to buy property. And then the more people buy, other people buy, so more rush to buy, then only you decide to buy because you're afraid of uh, scarcity. Let's also call uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> it's also called, there's another word you might know, kiasu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Asians uh, are very kiasu. Yeah? Uh, authority. Authority is that... Um, you always rely on authority, a professional investment banker telling you what to do, professional financial advisor. Sometimes car salesmen also pretend to be professional. So they give you advice and you believe, you know? So that's because we, 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 uh, we defer to authority 
And quite often, actually, people defer to um, celebrities as well. That's what you see in, in commercial. Celebrity but use a toothpaste, uh, you think that's yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. now, nowadays, there's influencer. Yeah, exactly, influencer. And, you know, they just get paid to influence, uh, to, to sell the product. And we know that, actually. We know that, but we yeah. still follow them. <laughs> Uh, there's two more. Let me just quickly go through it. Uh, temptation. Um, you make a resolution. You want to eat healthy, but you keep on take, you keep on doing the the unhealthy choices because of temptation. This is something machines don't have. You know, humans have temptation. You know? And uh, spotlight effect. Spotlight effect is when you know you you focus on something. In this case, you drive uh, drive in the road and then you underestimate uh, the speed. You know, because you're focusing on other things. Yeah, better examples here, but then you will get into a, a later a minor accident. So anyway, so what are these? These are all heuristics. What are these? These are rules of thumb. You use your thumb you know, to agak agak the distance, right? Rule of thumb. Or these are biases. Everybody has a bias. And then, uh, or, or these are mental shortcuts. You compare and con contrast. But is this our weakness? Or is this a human trait? Turns out it is a human trait. And if you want to take into economics, you should take into account all these behaviors. There are many more. These are only some. You must take into account. And remember, I said they are predictable. It's the same thing. You can predict. So, for instance, you, uh, that's why you know companies like Facebook and all that, they're very good in algorithm. They know behaviors. You know? So they can predict what you're going to do. They frame something. Thing, you know, they do, do uh, influencer and all that. They influence you to buy the product. They're experts. So we as uh, policy makers, we are also selling something. We are offering services or we are, or we are uh, coming up with uh, uh, some products. Right? And we are, we want to take up because uh, these take ups have been, you know, we have analyzed, they are good. But we should take into account people's behavior. And when we don't take into account, maybe many of you is, as policymakers, you sometimes wonder, we have a policy, it's very good, we give incentive, we did roadshow, we did so many things, we offer them, but they don't take up. Why is it? So then we blame them. We say, oh, these people are not educated or they have a mindset not so good, you know, they don't know how to choose. But there may be other things, other biases. So it's best that we understand and take this yeah. um, So let's look at these two examples in traditional decision making. If you say you want to make a decision or you want people to make a decision, but because of biases, mental shortcuts and heuristics, those decisions are suboptimal. Whereas if you take into account behavioral intervention, you do some intervention. You do, for instance, choice architecture. I'll mention choice architecture later. You do those things and you will probably get better decisions. Okay, I mentioned choice architecture. What, what, is, what is that? There are many other things. I'm not going to explain many of the behavioral uh, uh, theories. I, I explained some of the important ones, and one of them is this choice architecture. So um, the photo on the on the left, uh, any of you remember where this is? This is in KL. So it's in it's at the link, for instance. Uh, so what they've done is <clears throat> they made it interesting that people would take the staircase. Why? Actually, because the building doesn't have lifts or doesn't have escalators. Or they don't think that they want to put lifts and escalators, maybe expensive, or maybe they want people to be, you know, more healthy. So they make it like this, you know. Even in the Prince Court Hospital, I noticed the staircase they, they put there and how many, you know, you, you, you encourage for health reasons, how many calories you burn, for instance, to take the staircase. And, you know, when I go to Prince Court Hospital to visit people, for instance, I just like to take the staircase. Why? Maybe I was influenced by that, you know. So going up, going down, sometimes I, I like to uh, take double steps, you know, so these are behaviors which I myself are influenced by. 
Second picture, the one in the middle, I think this is very common nowadays, right? This is where you are trying to tell people to social distance. You can tell people, but these indicators will remind them. And sometimes we as policymakers, we can make rules, we can make regulation. But simple things like this, let's not brush it off as just not important. It's actually very important. It's just, it's, it affects health outcomes, it affects so many things, it affects economy, but simple things like this help. An uh, example on the right is also very interesting, World Wildlife, uh, World Wildlife Fund. Um, I think it's called something else now, not World Wildlife Fund. Um, where encouraging you to save paper, right? The more uh, you use paper, <laughs> the more deforestation happens in uh, South America. So it's a visual thing, right? So what is choice architecture is actually how you design, layout, or you present options that allow people to choose freely. I don't force you, up to you, you can, uh, you don't want to go, you don't want to take this test, it's up to you, but I influence your choice because these choices actually are good for you and good for me. So, did you notice that this is about nudging behavior and those things that I mentioned to you uh, can really become policy tools but for you to, to really introduce these policy tools, you must do a bit of research and understand people's intrinsic, inherent heuristics and biases, their behaviors, their biases, their shortcut, and then you nudge your behavior in those directions. So if you don't research, you may assume that you know, but you need to do a bit of research, you need to test a bit to see how people behave. Nothing wrong with that. You don't say that, ah, oh, it is so imperfect. Why I need to test? It's, if it's so good, I don't need to test. You just tell me, I just do. No, you need to test because people behave. But the way that you test, because you are test, that is a way for you to apply policy. Just look at it that way. A way for you to apply policy, but with testing. Right? Just like everything, let's say, you know that when a TV station, when they want to introduce the TV shows, actually they test, you know. Right. Uh, they test and see how this show is. It, is it well received or not? Or maybe you know, then if it's not so well received, they jump. It, it's quite normal. Even when we want to introduce product, we want to introduce a, a, a new exam set of questions or so. Sometimes schools, they actually have to test. It is acceptable to test. But what's interesting, look at the bullet points here. A successful behavioral intervention will help move the policy goal forward with no monetary incentive. Like example before, right? Is there money involved? Do I have to give you money? No. Do I have to make a penalty? Do I have to limit your choice? No. Do I have to introduce new regulation? Or do I have to go and enforce a regulation? No need. So when you think about it, actually is it is easier, it's cheaper to do this. It may seem, it may seem a lot of work, but actually it's cheaper because there is no, uh, external costs. For example, I give you an example. So for instance, you get people to social distance. So it seems so leche to do it, right? But the external cost is that health outcomes, as you can see in countries like uh, US and UK, where people are so free and look at how they're suffering because of the health outcomes, as opposed to a country like, let's say, uh, Vietnam. <laughs> Vietnam, okay, like, their rules are very tight but people are also very compliant. So their health outcomes are very good, less cases. So this is where, um, you know, there is an external cost, but through behavioral intervention, it's actually a low cost uh, thing that can be introduced. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at uh, another example. So I talk about, you know, um, whether you want to be uh, uh, enforcing or have regulations, right? Then we, we as policymakers, we think to ourselves, do we want a, a regulated economy? Uh, okay, can some countries are very regulated, let's say like, uh, um, you know, some, some second world country, nah? communist countries are very regulated, they have a regulated economy, but it has an unnecessary regulatory burden. And this is something that NPC also wants companies and government not to introduce unnecessary 
regulatory burden. You can have regulatory regulations, but no need to be unnecessary. Or on the other hand, when you have too much freedom, there's overconsumption, exploitation, neglect, abuse, wastage. So I show here some example. Let me just uh, share with you some example. Um, we, I think in Malaysia and many countries, we introduce a, a sugar tax. But um, uh, the sugar tax is, why do we have a sugar tax? Because we want people to be healthier. Why do we want people to be healthier? Because so that they don't get diabetes. Why is it we don't want them to get diabetes? Because when they go to the government hospital, they have to do dialysis. And actually it costs, the money, costs a lot of money for the government to provide these services for the public. So a healthier public will be actually a lot of cost saving. But the regulation, the sugar tax, does not cover drinks which are produced uh, on site. Let's say the, the bubble tea, <laughs> which uh, young people like to drink. Um, as you know, uh, the report said, oh, wow, the amount of sugar there is massive, right? Okay. Okay, so the third example is the soft drink. Uh, please uh, stop me if, uh, if the sound is not so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So the third example is the soft drink. But what the soft drink company does is that they give you more and then you end up being uh, so used to it. And then there's another trick that happens is that um, the prices of other goods like soya bean drink, for instance, I'm not saying in Malaysia, I'm saying in some country, they raise the price of the soya bean drink so that the soft drink, even though the, with the tax is higher, but the soya bean drink is higher, so in the end, this is still cheaper. So you still consume the soft drink and after a while you forget and then you drink. So what I'm saying is, see, you have, uh, you introduce a tax, then you have to regulate, you have to enforce. But actually what you should look at is the behavior of the consumer, the behavior of the young people, why they like, why they go and do this. So it's better to intervene at the behavior stage rather than the fact. <laughs> the picture on the right is, is also is just an example of overconsumption. <laughs> this is human nature, you know, why people, maybe this is pandemic, everybody is, yeah. I don't understand. What they so let's think of behavioral insights as, as I have touched on, it's really a policy tool. It can be other things. It can be a marketing tool. It can be many things. It can be how you actually manage your children, but look at it as a policy tool. Uh, it's also a diagnostic tool kid as well. Think of it as that way because when you diagnose policy through behavior, you then align your goal, uh, those goals of the public with the goals of you as policymakers in the government. Or you can diagnose people's responses. You have a, a pool of, of, of information there. And that leads to a, a database of evidence. And as I mentioned, behaviors are really systematic. And this evidence can be compared and exchanged between policymakers around the world. Actually, you can use data in other countries how they uh, use, how they actually uh, created a, be a behavior intervention. So, for instance, if you look at a country that has got people vaccinated, you want people vaccinated. Some people don't want to be vaccinated because they think it's bad, right? So you look at the examples in other countries how they do, and actually the behaviors are similar in our country and other places too. So the database or evidence pool around the world is actually very useful. Yeah. How is the line, Mr. Shaidi? Yeah, it's okay? clear now. It's clear. Thank you. Now, so when we develop this this framework, um, we we also want to look at the. Uh, research. So you need to research the user of the, the policy that you're introducing. Uh, you need to research based on the context, the environment around where people are actually are subject to the policy and, uh, and how these policies are being delivered. Those people that deliver the policy, maybe frontline people who deliver the policy, how they behave as well. So the thing on the right is just to, to, for you to note that we don't assume that people are just non-compliant or people are uneducated. Or it's not that. It's actually normal behavior. These behaviors are both urban, rural, rich, poor. Everybody has the same behavior, actually, mm. right, to different degrees. Second, 
these behavioral insights, they require experimentation. Again, I have already stressed to you, don't think of experimentation as a weakness. It's actually something that is to, to customize and make things even more effective. Later in session, uh, I think two or three, maybe three, we will talk about the standardized testing methods. But you can use standardized testing methods like random control tiles or A-B testing, etc. you know, to, to yeah. experiment whether interventions work. And um, finally, uh, behavioral insights should be evidence-based. That means you can document the results and the unsuccess unsuccessful, not just successful, unsuccessful interventions are also useful information. Quite often, I think if I go to the internet, I research other countries, quite often they just talk about the successful intervention, what they did. <laughs> but, but they should show, one is that without any intervention, just introduce policy, what happened, what's the result. Second, they introduce this intervention, what's the result, maybe it doesn't work so well. Third, they introduce that, maybe it doesn't work so well. So you know, then you show a percentage of how, how the responses are. That is a bit more... Um, systematic way for you to implement a policy. And note the thing on the right, don't look at these policy failures as an embarrassment. Policy doesn't work. People are, people are you know, uh, mindset is very negative. They don't look at it as a source of knowledge, source of yeah. knowledge. I, I guess partly because of the buyers, eh? one of the buyers or the leaders of other countries do have that issue of maybe status quo, loss of versions, things like that. That's the reason why they don't really publish the, the failures. That, that is very true, actually. The <laughs> people who, who create the policy themselves have the bias. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think I mentioned somewhere that even uh, the, you know, the policy that maybe on the, second, the third bullet point on the top, or policy delivery team themselves have, have a bit of bias, maybe. <laughs> so... Um, uh, now, so the question is, when, when, uh, when do we use these uh, policy, uh, uh, these behavioral uh, interventions? Right? Very often is when we have an objective where we want to have a behavioral change that is very good for overall policy. We need a bit of behavioral change. So maybe getting citizens to save electricity or increase exercise, drive slower. So think about it, eh? why increase exercise? Because of cost to Ministry of Health. Why drive so slower? Because cost of time loss and accidents and all that. <laughs> you know, police yeah. time and having to record all these things. Why save electricity? Because the cost of importing um, things like uh, gas uh, or utilization of gas or coal or, or something is very expensive as well. So we need the intervention at the user stage as well. Second is when the uh, when things like uh, people's attention, people's how they identify, how they place themselves, people's willpower, and the social norm of how their community is become bottlenecks when the policy is being introduced. I will, we will explain that uh, in uh, session two about these bottlenecks. Very interesting, these bottlenecks. Okay. Uh, but they affect how, why policy is not being taken up or complied with so well because of this bottleneck. So when you need people to respond um, in spite of these bottlenecks, so you need to have, uh, you need to introduce some interventions accordingly, people's attention, they may not pay attention to certain things or may not identify with certain things or they don't have a willpower to do or the social norm around them. They, people just don't do it, you know? So you okay. need to. And, and lastly, uh, ah, yeah, this last uh, sentence, remember, see, policymakers <laughs> are subjected to biases and influencing, this, influencing factors. They themselves are subject to biases. So even in the policymaking process, you might notice and then in the policy making process, you know, the policy cycle. So sometimes, uh, just because the top guy wants to do something, sometimes, you know, you just do and you, know, you yeah. don't have enough research. Sometimes a bit of research, but I, I'm sure if you can provide evidence, 
you can show that, you know, yes, you can do this, but, you know, these are the ways to do it. Right? So uh, looking at the diagram on the right, really why you want to do all this is better policy outcomes. That's your, your main goal, actually. So I mentioned uh, the policy cycle, uh, the one on the left is, is the general policy cycle, like how we define a policy, we draft and implement, we monitor, we evaluate and all that. Now, um, so what's interesting is that in behavioral insights, you can actually apply DI at all, all these five stages of the policy cycle, even when you define you need to define according to BI. When you draft the policy, you need to also take into account BI. This is what the prime framework tries to share, that how you embed this behavior interventions in each stage of this policy making. When you implement as well, you take into account BI, uh, responses, biases, as well as your interventions. And then you monitor, monitor, you measure the results, you compare the results, and you evaluate the outcomes, or you expand the outcomes. So the I applies to it. Now let's look on the right. This is a this is where we then compare the traditional way of looking at uh, policy making, economic policy making, without the BI. Just now I mentioned you can embed BI, but without the BI, in the past, uh, people like. Uh, traditional economics from the time of Adam Smith and all that. Uh, the theory is that you give the price and you give the incentive and you give all the necessary information. The invisible hand, eh? invisible hand means people collectively, invisibly then, we all make their own individual decisions in their own respective individual interests. That together then, collectively, it becomes the best policy outcome. That's what traditional economics assumes. Pricing, like you set the price, let's say you set the duty for import products, you set the, the tariff, you set the sugar tax and all that. You provide grants, subsidies, penalties, fines and all that. And then you have education, awareness and all that. But sometimes it doesn't work so well because it doesn't take into account behaviors. Now look, let's look at our case study. Uh, this, this one, let's, uh, I, I'm sharing the latest uh, budget. This is regarding cigarettes, smoking and all that. So there's a lot of uh, things introduced. Let's not, let's not look at this negatively. Let's look at this positively. It's a lot of uh, things which are introduced, which is uh, relating to uh, taxation. There's a taxation. There's uh, a lot of regulation, a lot of control and tightening of control, even more tightening, uh, duties and all that. So the, the metrics that tend to be looked at are things like the tax revenue and the gross national income contribution. But what is hidden, I'm not saying that it's not being measured, but what is not so visible are the administrative costs to doing this, the medical costs of, of, uh, of uh, smoking, uh, do the medical costs reduce or remain the same? The enforcement costs, when you want to enforce a uh, transshipment, for instance, there are additional costs. Incarceration, incarceration when people actually can get put into prison or something, you have to tank up orang. Eh? So that's incarceration cost and the social cost of smoking. All these are probably done by the researchers but they're not so visible at the moment. But if we look in the past, these are some of the data that if we look at the top corner, the tax rate for uh, cigarettes has been increasing and increasing. And then you look at the next uh, chart, the the price of the cigarette, therefore, both premium and sub-premium have of course in, has of course increased because of the tax increase. Of course, inflation also creates the increase. But the dark blue one is the illegal 
illegal contraband cigarettes. So you have to enforce that one as well because people would choose alternative. Yeah. With the illegal cigarette, I think it's still at three ringgit, right? Mm. Three ringgit per box. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> eh? So, and then if you look in the third chart there, eh, the uh, percentage increase in illegal cigarettes available in the Malaysian market has actually increased. Mm. Right? So, you can see that while you are trying to control using the traditional tools of taxation, the alternative is being created mm. where if you want to control the alternative, you have to have a lot of enforcement, administration, incarceration costs. And then you look at the last chart at the bottom there is that while retail prices uh, have increased, I think this is maybe per cigarette is 0 0.028, something like that. But the consumption per capita has actually more or less reduced a little bit, but not really so much. It's not commensurate which, with the increase in the price of the cigarette. So what does that show? It's same with the, the sugar tax. You have more taxation. Uh, it doesn't work so well. I'm not saying that we don't have those regulations. I'm saying yes, we have those regulations. These regulations are good, but we must introduce them together with BI interventions. If you introduce them on their own, it is suboptimal because this is the, um, uh, the push factor, but the pull factor is people desire to smoke. That is the intervention you need to focus on. So you need to handle that side. If not, it's one-sided based on traditional economics, not based on new economics, which includes behavior economics or behavioral insights. So then uh, actually I prepared this slide because in the, my last webinar, people also, this question came about, what about cigarette, cigarettes? You know, how do we stop people from smoking cigarettes? We have the, the, the logo at the back, I mean, the, the, on the box, we show those nasty pictures, right? And then we have Amaran and all that, right? How do we stop when we, now we don't sell the cigarette at the shops, you know, we cannot advertise and all that. But how do we stop, you know? So, and then, um, actually, I also don't have an answer, but I can lead, I can, I can suggest something that maybe we need to think about, which are, you know, like every illness, every illness has therapeutics, for especially for large, uh, non-communicable disease kind of illness. Those kind of illness need a lot of therapeutics. But you can introduce medical therapeutics as well as behavioral therapeutics. So these kind of solutions actually are very um, cumbersome, long-winded. It's easier to just come up with the rules, introduce a tax, that's it, right? And then enforce yeah. it. But uh, the cost to uh, the police uh, to enforce, the cost to the, to the uh, court system or to the, to the prisons, uh, there's another call, the cost to Ministry of Health, all that is uh, not really the direct problem. So although this sounds very cumbersome, actually it may be a better uh, solution to work together with the, uh, the, the, the laws or the tax laws or whatever other regulations you introduce to introduce this at the same time. What are these behavioral therapeutics? These things like this that I've shown here, personal health coach, education model, digital journal. These are examples which uh, Naluri has introduced, right? So I pick up the idea from them. But then you have metrics. We look at the pathology of the, of the pathology of the, the people, the health outcomes, the long-term return on, on, on investment on these things. So there is a possible solution. It needs to be tried. It's cumbersome. It's, it takes time, but actually it costs less. It costs much less and you may have uh, better outcomes. So me, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I would say it's better for long term. It may take up uh, more effort earlier, but it is it's going to be better in the long term. Am I am I right, Sandy? Yes, I, I think so too. Yeah. So, but you, we we have looked at solutions that don't work for a long time. So maybe yeah. we have to look at things re relating to BI. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, this is my, I think I've got only, uh, this is my second last slide, actually. Yeah. So, we've covered some examples. So, these are just, I give a snapshot of examples in other countries where uh, the first one is increase the medication, uh, medication rate, uh, the taking of medication from 44% to 84% in Budava uh, through virtual supervision. That's interesting. Uh, tripling the amount of energy provided provider switches to save electricity costs by sending personalized information, informative letters. So they're by sending personalized informative letter to, I think DND also did this uh, some time ago, encourage people to, to save electricity by sending, they use the uh, O-Power, O-Power use behavioral insights. So O-Power helped DND to do this. Uh, third example, uh, increasing early filing of taxes in Indonesia by sending personal timely reminders, bringing additional revenue to the government. Uh, increasing credit card debt repayment by 22%, introducing interactive data-driven features of bank website. So you tailor-made, you custom-made yeah, for, for the public. Yeah. Increasing repayment of red light running and speed, speed uh, speeding fines by 7% through, by simplifying the traffic offense notices, but you make it simple, then actually people want to pay, but then you make it simple. So these are just some examples. I've come to quite the end of, of uh, this uh, session one. Uh, I don't want to put so much information, it might be a bit yeah. heavy. So, uh, so in session two and three, we'll look at other things like design strategies and delivery processes. So uh, I think that's all for now, okay. over to you. Uh, it is interesting. I think from your first session, we can see the importance, the need, and we can see that it's proven almost quite, quite a lot of countries when you give the, the example have been using BI. So it is something that not to be considered, it should be applied. Uh, and, and there is one question uh, in the chat, actually. Uh, could you please elaborate? on the tool used in measuring the effectiveness of the I approach? This is a question from Ileana. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ileana. Um, yes, uh, I have mentioned that there are some uh, tools that are used. Uh, many researchers use randomized control trials um, as a systematic way to do so when you then have control groups and then you have the group that has the intervention. Sometimes you have more than one intervention, okay, one uh, nudge, okay, one nudge. So let's say control group A, then uh, nudge one, you, B, con group D, then group C is nudge two, and then you compare, and then you use statistical analysis. That's one way. Or another way is simple A-B testing, this, this one and that one. Uh, uh, which one has better results, you know, There's, those are various ways. We'll cover more under uh, yeah. session three, uh, measuring results. That's another question from Mr. P.W. Wong. Uh, in the current era of widespread use of social media, where we are embedded in a network of social relationship and those we come into contact with will influence our action. What are the ways our government can harness the power of these social network to enable collective action and encourage behaviors to increase compliance or take up rate of government initi initiatives? Oh, this is a very powerful media. question. Mm. Very good. Well, first, first, uh, the government has to uh, understand the use of behavioral insights, the usefulness of behavioral insights and maybe then have a little um, uh, or, uh, implementing agencies or uh, the departments that actually implement this behavioral insight because the social media is a very powerful tool because it's in your face all the time. Okay, It's in your face all the time. Sometimes when you want to sleep also it's there, right? <laughs> so it will influence you uh, negatively as well as positively. So some governments have understood it and some governments use it negatively. So when you hear when they said in the US, they say Russia influenced the elections, 
right? Using Facebook. Uh, Russia already gets it, you know. Uh, and, and even, they say Iran also used Facebook to influence the recent US election, they say, by giving, you know, uh, fake accounts and things like that. So it has a negative effect. And uh, now I think governments uh, are trying to control Facebook and Twitter, etc., not to be the medium to do all these things. But governments, like our government, for instance, must be very aware of the power of behavioral insights and to use it both for, not just for things to, to influence the public, but also for good policy outcomes, like really things that matter, like smoking or things like that. Now you want to reduce because it's really bad for society, you know? Uh, like, you know, the youth are not taking up, you know, uh, not furthering the education. These are very long-term, deep impact to society. So we should think to become those the power of social media for that. I also saw from your example where quite quite a lot are uh, using personalized message, uh, sending personalized timely reminders. This is, I think, social network is one of the best way for the government to send a very personalized message uh, to, to the users, to the citizen. Yes, very much so. In fact, I think MKN, Majlis Selamatan, I already yeah. said messages right to, to the unit sms right but um, that's sms but maybe you can think about uh, other kinds of information which are a bit more interesting looking yeah. you know uh, or gamify game people like games you know that's yeah. Kind of, you know, it's all about games you know actually yeah because from your example uh, we can see can companies like cambridge analytica misuse the data I I is that still considered sbi when, when they actually, you know, collect data without our knowledge, data outside of the system, it, it's something in between Facebook and them. Is that still considered SBI? Well, co uh, collecting uh, data which is unauthorized like that is, is uh, just uh, wrong according to many of the PDPA rules, which so they are doing yeah. that. But after they collect the data, the process of researching it, the process of attaching behavioral insights theories mm -hmm. and responses, that one is using BI. Probably they are using BI. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting when you show this slide heuristic. Uh, loss aversion, I saw a lot of research on loss aversion. And even in a situation where we feel that incentive is the best way, but actually loss aversion is going to be way better than... than uh, incentive. Do, do you have any example or do you agree with this statement, Mr. Eddie? Yeah, yeah there are many, uh, uh, many examples of, of loss aversion. Um, one, one easy example, uh, quite often, uh, any of you uh, invest money in, in uh, let's say, property or stocks, uh, shares or something, right? When you uh, make money from the property, uh, or are you happy? La? But then when you lose money, you're so sakit hati, you will never forget, you know? <laughs> for, yeah. Even though you make money uh, more, <laughs> but the little that you lose, because the uh, loss for humans mean more than the gain. Yeah. When you lose, you hurt more than you are happy. Happy people forget to. So is there something wrong with people? No, that's just the way people are. It is like that. You cannot change. That's why I say it's predictable. And it's the same everywhere in the world. Loss aversion is the same everywhere in the world. You see, you give somebody 100, 100 ringgit, and then after that, uh, the person lost the 100 ringgit. Yeah. Even though actually they are given, uh, it's not their money, somebody gave them, but they lost the money. They're so sakit hati, you know, because actually it wasn't their money in the first place. But hati hati, they rasa sangat that is loss aversion. I saw one later study on teachers. Uh, they have of course, A-B testing. Uh, one group, uh, a promise for, for incentive, for bonus, if they hit the KPI. And another group of teachers are given the money first. But uh, was it uh, if they cannot reach, cannot fulfill the KPI, the money will be taken back. The group where was offered the money to be taken back did perform way better than the first group uh, that was promised 
to get bonus. So it shows that we are very worried of losing the money that we get. Even though money is was given to you in the first place, right? Yeah, yeah. So this, this is a great example when policymakers want to introduce something. You take back, people hurt more. When you, take yeah. back, you drive the performance more, actually. So I guess that that's it for today because in terms of time, we are, we are, we are actually on time. Right? Now it's 10.57. Do you, do you have any... To conclude, do you have any, any message, last message before we end today's session, Mr. Eddie? Well, um, I will go through, let me just flash the, the first slide with the, the, the topics. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, today we just talked about principles and theories. We're not going uh, too heavy into this. Right? I just want you to understand a bit about BI and all that. And then later we'll go into... Uh, more of how to actually design the, the intervention delivery. Um, but uh, I, do, I do feel that uh, in many countries, um, in, especially in uh, government, VI actually works very well with government. It has worked very well in uh, marketing companies that do marketing. It works very well in government. Many countries have already introduced um, uh, VI units uh, uh, in their, within the government because it is a way for you to actually uh, solve a lot of policy problem at a lower cost. And I think we also need to, to focus on that. Uh, especially in uh, Malaysia, we have a lot of uh, complicated social problems, which we, uh, we throw money at it and it doesn't really work. And then uh, every time we keep uh, throwing more money and we think that we have a better solution, but uh, maybe we should look at... Uh, how people respond to that, how people behave accordingly. And it's actually uh, can, can bring some productivity and bring some benefit to the country. Okay, thank you, Mr. Adi. Oh, but, but suddenly there's one question in the chat room. Do we still oh. have one minute to answer the question? I guess maybe we can try and answer. Currently, most of the people living in stress condition, uh, how BI affect the effectiveness how BI affect the effectiveness of BI approach? It came from Muhammad Hosni. Uh, so are we talking about stress period like now because of uh, lockdown and all that? I guess, I guess. Yeah. So um, so this, this is interesting because uh, uh, people's uh, behavior has, uh, has to adapt to the conditions. Uh, people have to, um, uh, from time to time, like, like I showed just now, they have to go out and they have to uh, do social distancing. And uh, we, I think there has not been enough research on what, what we can do to alter good behavior. Maybe this is a good time to alter good behavior because people are, you know, maybe more kesedaran, you know, like, oh, okay, you know, so I'm, I cannot be with my family. Maybe this is a good time to introduce good behavior intervention. I think we can start looking at uh, some new solutions here. Right. Thank you. On that note, I guess that's it for today. Uh, I do hope that the viewers uh, will gain a lot of knowledge from today's session, as I am. I, I, I learned a lot today. And... So stay tuned, register for the next series because we'll be having another one in 26 January, uh, 10 a.m. So see you guys uh, next week. I uh, hope uh, you guys will take care, stay safe, and that's it from me and from Mr. Eddie. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And thank you, Mr. Shahidi, and thank you, NPC. Assalamualaikum. <laughs>